proposal. And that does it for today's Washington Journal. We'll bring you now to the floor where they are going to bring up spending, government, keeping the government running for this year, for 2011. We're expecting about one hour of general debate. Thanks for watching. Majority and minority leaders and the minority whip limited to five minutes each. But in no event shall debate continue beyond 11 a.m. Uh, 11 <clears throat> 50 a.m. The chair recognized the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Lipinski, for five minutes. Excuse me. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As one of only a handful of engineers in Congress, I'm proud again to sponsor a resolution honoring our nation's engineers during National Engineers Week. This is my seventh year introducing this resolution, and it has a special significance this year. Next week will mark the 60th anniversary of Engineers Week. And with nearly half of the practicing engineers in our country eligible to retire over the next few years, the central goal of Engineers Week, attracting new students to engineering careers, has never been more important. That's why educating and inspiring America's youth about engineering and science needs to be a national priority. Engineers design and build all of our everyday products such as bridges, airplanes, roads, computers, medical devices, cars, power plants, just to name a few. But engineering is more than that. Engineering is problem solving. We have many problems to solve, from our dependence on foreign oil to our crumbling infrastructure. And as a recent National Academies report explained, while only 4% of our nation's workforce is composed of engineers and scientists, this group disproportionately creates jobs for the other 96%. America's 2.5 million engineers have helped make our country great by solving problems and turning dreams into reality. And America's future depends on them. Unfortunately, oftentimes their contributions, though, go unnoticed. National Engineers Week seeks to fix this problem through events aimed at educating youth and fostering public awareness of the vital contributions made by engineers to our quality of life and our economic prosperity. Engineers Week promotes recognition among parents, teachers, and students of the importance of STEM education and literacy. This year's theme is Engineers Make a World of Difference, a celebration of engineers' volunteerism. It recognizes the more than one million hours annually that America's engineers contribute to public service. The celebratory events include the Future City Competition, Introduce a Girl to Engineering Day, and Discover Engineering Family Day, which all impart an appreciation of the wonders of engineering to our children of all backgrounds. I can attest to my own childhood experiences with science and engineering and how they captivated me. I remember in high school at St. Ignatius, my calculus and physics teachers especially, Father Thule and Father Fergus, helped mold my childhood fascination into an interest in engineering. These teachers, together with informal experiences at places like the Museum of Science and Industry, and even at Brookfield Zoo, helped motivate me to pursue an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering from Northwestern University, and a degree in engineering economic systems from Stanford. One of the central goals of National Engineers Week is to provide this kind of inspiration for the next generation of students. During Engineers Week in Chicago, I will be attending the Engineers Week celebratory dinner, where they will give the Washington Award to a professor from Purdue University and will be honoring students who, are, who have made contributions in engineering through the Future Cities projects. I'd like to encourage all of my colleagues 
to co-sponsor this resolution, to go home, find some Engineers Week celebrations that are going on, participate in, in your districts. This is a great opportunity for us to thank the engineers who have contributed so much to our country and inspire that next generation of engineers that our country so terribly needs to solve the problems that face us today. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Poe, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I bring you news from the war on our third front, the southern border with Mexico. Last Saturday, two American teenagers were brutally shot and killed in Mexico in the Mexican border town of Juarez, Mexico. That's right across the Rio Grande River from El Paso, Texas. On Thursday, drug cartels gunned down eight people in a bar in Juarez. On Sunday, Homero Salcedo, the head of security and intelligence for the state of Nuevo Leon in Mexico, was shot in the head and his car was set ablaze. Nuevo Leon is close to the U.S. border and once was considered one of the safest towns in all of Mexico. This murder is evidence that the narco-terrorists are continuing to expand their control with our neighbors to the south in Mexico. There are portions of Mexico that are under the control of the drug bandits, and honest law enforcement is not non-existent. However, Secretary of Homeland Security Janet Napolitano has said that the situation on the border has, quote, been mischaracterized by lawmakers for political reasons. Well, the same can be said of Homeland Security Director Napolitano. She mischaracterizes the border region, claiming it is safe. This is either for political reasons or because she refuses to admit the federal government is unwilling or incapable of securing the border. More than 34,000 people have been murdered in our neighboring country of Mexico since the drug cartels began their reign of terror in 2006. In my opinion, neither the United States nor Mexico has operational control of some border regions. Drugs and money are smuggled north into the U.S. and guns and, or drugs and people are smuggled into the U.S. and guns and money are smuggled to the south into Mexico. And this is just not a Mexican problem. For example, 27 percent of the inmates in United States prisons are not U.S. citizens. 17.5 percent are from the nation of Mexico. And a whopping 37 percent of Texas border jails contain foreign nationals. If the border is so secure, Ms. Napolitano, how come so many thousands of illegals are pouring into our country, committing serious crimes and filling up our prisons? How can any reasonable person say our borders are secure when 27 percent of America's prisons are the home to foreign nationals? They wouldn't be in prison if they didn't cross the border in the first place. There is more. Jose Reyes Alfaro, an illegal immigrant from El Salvador, went on a killing rampage in Manassas on Wednesday. He shot and killed three people and injured another. Alfaro had been ordered to be deported in 2002, but he just never left the country. These murders could have been prevented if our border security plan, Ms. Napolitano, was working. An eight-year-old girl in Fairfax, Virginia, was raped by an illegal in her own home. Her rapist was Salvador Portillo Severa, a known criminal who was living in the United States illegally. In 2003, Portero Severo, an MS-13 gang member, was arrested and deported to El Salvador. But since we have open borders, the child rapist was able to sneak back into the United States unnoticed and under the radar. He was even arrested in November of 2010 but rather than be held in jail for deportation, he was released back on the streets because no one was able to check his illegal status. And one month later, Salvador Portillo Severa raped an innocent eight-year-old girl in her own home. This disgusting crime could have been prevented if we secured our borders, deported illegals that were in this country, and kept them from returning. Tell the parents of this eight-year-old girl, Madam Secretary, that our border crisis is just mischaracterized. Our system is flawed, and Homeland Security better understand that it is the duty of the federal government to protect the people of this nation and quit making excuses. It's way past time to put more National Guard troops on the border. I've introduced legislation to put 10,000 National Guard troops on the southern border to be paid for by the federal government, but supervised by the four state governors. We protect the borders of other nations. It's about time we protect our own. 
Meanwhile, it appears Homeland Security is living in Never Never Land or blissfully unaware of the real world on the southern border or mischaracterizes the situation for political reasons. And that's just the way it is. I yield back. The gentleman yields back the remainder of his time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Cicilline, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today with great concern about the future of our country. And that's because in the past few days, we've seen the valley between the hardworking middle class and the rich continue to grow wider and wider. It's a matter of priorities, Madam Speaker. And right now, we can see very clearly where my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have placed their priorities. It's not in the well-being of our workforce, not in the effectiveness of our classrooms, not in the safety of our neighborhoods. No, Madam Speaker, the priorities of the majority party are not with the people who have worked hard all their lives to earn a decent wage, buy a decent home, put their kids through school, and do what they can to keep their families and communities strong. The priorities of my Republican colleagues lay with America's most successful, the hedge fund managers, Wall Street financiers, and investment bankers. That's why they worked so hard to give those folks another tax break at the end of last year under the guise of extending unemployment benefits for many people who lost jobs through no fault of their own. But my friends, you see the rich didn't need another tax break. Not now, not when their taxes are the lowest they've been since 1950, and a tax cut that added $800 billion to our deficit over the next decade. In addition to that, as part of the Recovery Act, Congress enacted the largest tax cut in American history, and Democrats provided additional tax rebates for businesses that provide their employees with health insurance. Amidst these tremendous tax breaks for the past two years, the Republicans are moving forward with a dangerous spending bill, one that continues to give rewards to the rich and literally guts the initiatives most meaningful to middle-class families. Simply put, the Republican spending bill is irresponsible and tone deaf to the needs of a healing nation. It cuts jobs, threatens American innovation, and diminishes investments in rebuilding America. It makes devastating cuts to education, reducing Pell Grants by $800 per student and kicking more than 200,000 children out of Head Start. It reduces the competitiveness of our workforce by slashing $1.6 billion in job training and cutting $120 million in alternative youth training that sends kids to work in construction and other trades. Critical skills that will help us make things again in America and put us on better footing to compete with the rest of the world. It derails $2.5 billion in funding for high-speed trains, canceling 76 projects in 40 states, and the loss of 25,000 jobs focused on rebuilding America. And at the same time, reduces our domestic security by eliminating 1,330 police officers and 2,400 firefighters, making our communities less safe. The work of reducing our deficit and controlling spending will be hard to be sure. The fact of the matter is that we have to cut spending, but we have to do it responsibly. We cannot cut what makes us competitive and what helps us to innovate, to succeed in the global economy, and ultimately to create jobs. The President's budget makes some serious cuts to good programs. Some I strongly object to. But as we work to cut spending, we have to be sure that it's not at the expense of continuing to support initiatives that create jobs, educate our children, and keep our communities safe. We have to be serious and smart about how we address America's budget challenges. This week, we will begin debate here in this chamber on this budget challenge. I've heard from many of my constituents about the concerns that they have related to the federal budget for this year. It's those conversations and the families I've met all across Rhode Island during the course of my campaign that I've got on my mind. I know what their priorities are. I've seen the circumstances, and I understand the challenges that their families are facing. My friends, we owe it to the hardworking people of our country who are struggling to get by and who are playing by the rules, but just waiting for someone to stand up for them rather than the rich guy on Wall Street. We owe it to America's hardworking people to have a serious and thoughtful debate in the hopes of producing a smart and sensible budget for our country. My friends, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle have become captive to an extremist agenda that harms people who are already hurting the most. That's why it's critical we ask our Republican friends, just what are your priorities? Do we have the courage to come together, not as Democrats or Republicans, but as Americans, 
and invest in our country's greatest asset, our people, the people who built this great nation and who we must believe in now more than ever to move our country forward to a prosperous and promising future. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the remainder of his time. I now, <clears throat> the chair recognizes the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Heck, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize a heroic Nevadan who passed away February 2, 2011. His name was Francisco Frank Sedula. He was born in the Philippines in Pasay City on January 7, 1923. Frank studied journalism at the University of Santo Tomas until he joined the Philippine resistance in 1941. At just 17 years old, he fought to disrupt the J Japanese military's occupation. Eventually, Frank was captured and tortured by the Japanese, but he managed to escape and rejoin the guerrilla fighters. On December 26, 1941, Frank fought in the Battle of Peace. More than 100 American and Filipino soldiers fought and died in the battle. Their sacrifice gave General MacArthur's troops, his small Yusefe forces, enough time to assemble in Bataan. Commander Sedula was the lone survivor of the three-day battle, he was bayoneted four times and left for dead. The natives assigned to bury the dead found him alive and nursed him back to health. Once healthy, he again rejoined the guerrilla forces and continued the fight. Later in the war, Frank helped liberate American prisoners of war. When the war ended, Frank served as the Filipino Veterans Legion National Commander for almost three decades. During his term as National Commander, the Filipino Veterans Legion created significant new benefits for their members. In 2005, Commander Sedula authored Filipino Veterans of World War II and Endangered Human Species to help inform congressional members and veteran supporters about World War II Filipino veterans who were promised and later denied recognition and benefits for 60 years. Frank was a man who set goals, then accomplished them. Frank achieved one goal, when the World War II Filipino Veterans Equity Bill became law. After the law passed, Frank co-authored a new book, Denial and Restitution by America. This sequel to his first book thanked the Congressional and Senate leaders who fought to turn the World War II Filipino Veterans Equity Bill into law. For 20 years, he planned to construct a memorial marker at kilometer 134 in Quezon, Philippines to honor and memorialize the men who lost their lives in the battle. Commander Sedula recently returned from a trip to the Philippines where he finalized the funding for that dream. I am honored to call Commander Sedula a friend and a Nevadan, and Madam Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. I now rec the chair recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Kind, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to commend and thank my good friend and colleague from the Pittsburgh area, Jason Altmaier, for delivering on his Super Bowl bet with me last evening. As we now know, a little over a week ago, my Green Bay Packers defeated his Pittsburgh Steelers 31-25 to win Super Bowl 45. It was the Packers' 13th world title and their fourth Super Bowl victory, enabling them to bring home once again where it belongs, the Vince Lombardi Trophy, to Titletown, USA, Green Bay, Wisconsin. And to the victor belongs the spoils. So last night, Jason and his staff delivered to my office some of Pittsburgh's finest cuisine, Promonte sandwiches and Iron City brew. Now, it didn't quite rival the world-famous tailgate parties that we have at Lambeau Field, but it wasn't bad. We may have fun with our sports teams around here from time to time, but it's also, also useful to remind ourselves that at the end of the day, when the game is played and the score is settled, that it is just only a game. And no one expressed that more eloquently than the MVP of Super Bowl 45, Green Bay Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers. It was recently reported that earlier in the season, Aaron Rodgers has sent a big care package out to his former girlfriend's elementary school in California where she's teaching. And in it was uh, a host of school supplies along with a bunch of Packer t-shirts and sweatshirts and other Packer paraphernalia. 
But also included in the care package was a note that Aaron Rodgers wrote to his former girlfriend, the teacher of that class, which read, just to be clear, what you're doing in your life right now is a heck of a lot more important than what I'm doing in my life. It's really refreshing to see a professional athlete at the peak of his career, at the height of his game, stay so well grounded, understanding what really is important to the future of our country, which is the future of our children and their educational success in the classroom. And whether he called for it or not, Aaron Rodgers has turned into a terrific role model for all of our children across this country. It's a constant reminder of the challenges that we still face and the values that we still must hold dear uh, in this country. So I too want to congratulate Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packer football team for their success, the Packer organization, the tens of thousands of Packer fans who are part owner of the Packer franchise, including my own family. And in the immortal words of my 12-year-old son, Matthew, who shortly after their Super Bowl victory last week, turned to me and said, hey, Dad, you know, that was a lot of fun. Let's do it again. So indeed, let's do this again next season. I wish the Packers well, and I thank Aaron, uh, Jason Altmeyer and his staff for delivering the goodies to our office last night. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back the remainder of his time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. DeFazio, for five minutes. Our nation is in dire financial straits, and unfortunately, uh, many on both sides of the aisle are blowing smoke about how serious they are in dealing with this problem. The fact is we're looking at a record $1.6 trillion deficit. Now, it wouldn't have been a record, and it wouldn't have been $1.6 trillion, but for one vote the Obama-McConnell tax compromise, the Republicans insisting that all of the Bush tax cuts passed in a time of surplus should be continued in a time of record deficits. That means tax cuts for millionaires and billionaires and other special interests with borrowed money, or we will forego the revenue of having them pay a fair share of their taxes, say the rate they paid in the Clinton era when the economy did very well, and they did very well. So with that one single vote, Suddenly, we jumped up to a $1.6 trillion deficit. Now, the Republican majority says, oh, no, 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 cutting taxes doesn't count. Their rules deem that cutting taxes doesn't count. We can cut taxes without reducing spending, borrow the money, increase the deficit and the debt, but they say it doesn't count. They have deemed that in their rules. So they're really blowing smoke here. You cannot pretend that you're serious about the deficit if you say we can continue to reduce income. Here's what this year's federal budget looks like. We, this is the total budget. Look, we're up borrowing almost half of what we're spending from China and other places around the world. We're borrowing $1.6 trillion, and the federal tax revenue is $2.2 billion. Those are just extraordinary numbers. Now, they say they'll fix that by cutting. Well, here we go. Here we go again. Def the budget, $3.8 trillion. Deficit, $1.6 trillion. But they say, but wait a minute. You can't increase revenues. Nope. You could decrease revenues. They say that wouldn't count. Uh, then, uh, oh, well, uh, Department of Defense is off limits. Uh, entitlements are all off limits. Mandatory spending, meaning agriculture subsidies and other egregious things, those are all off limits. We will balance the budget by going after non-defense discretionary spending. Hmm. Seems to be a little bit of a problem here. Here's the deficit, $1.6 trillion. Now, if we eliminated all non-defense discretionary spending, which would mean basically the daily operations of the government in the United States outside the Defense Department, all gone, close the door, open the federal prisons, let the prisoners out, no more Justice Department, no more FBI. Uh, you know, no more uh, 
Border Patrol, none of those things. Get, get, just get rid of all that stuff, you know, the IRS, Environmental Protection Agency, Department of Education, Health Education, you know, the Centers for Disease Control, all gone. Well, hmm, you would still have a $1.1 tri trillion dollar deficit. But don't worry, they're going to get us there by cutting. You can't get there simply by cutting. Yes, you need to cut. You need to reduce and eliminate wasteful programs. But you can't pretend that you can cut revenues, that you can maintain tax loopholes for companies that go move their headquarters to a post office box in the Bahamas, like Carnival Cruise Lines, well, excuse me, their, their post office box is in Panama, uh, who operate out of the U.S., get their customers in the U.S., use the ports of the U.S., use the U.S. Coast Guard and all whose executives live in the U.S., and they don't pay taxes here. Or ExxonMobil, who doesn't pay taxes in the United States but pays other way, places around the world. We borrow money to give a subsidy to ExxonMobil, yet in the last quarter of last year they had the largest single corporate profit in the history of the world. But we're going to borrow money to give them tax rebates for taxes they didn't pay in the United States of America that they paid elsewhere. That system can't be fixed, the Republicans say. Those would be tax increases. Can't plug those tax loopholes. Agriculture subsidies, pay people $20 billion not to grow things. Nope, can't go there. We're going to balance the budget by, by hacking away at non-defense discretionary spending. Unfortunately, uh, physics and reality uh, don't work for them here, nor does math, because it's a tiny fraction of the deficit if we totally eliminated those programs instead of just hacking at them. So let's get real. Let's get together here. The country is confronted with a serious long-term debt problem. And as everybody said yesterday, everything's on the table. Well, it's not, but everything should be on the table. The gentleman yields back the remainder of his time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The next few days on the floor of the House will be critical for the future of public broadcasting. People here uh, with the new Republican majority are uh, hoping to save, the, for saving less than one cent per day on this ideological uh, assault on what for 170 million Americans is their voice of America, their window to the world. In an era of local papers and radio stations being gobbled up by large conglomer conglomerates, um, public broadcasting in the 1,300 stations around the country are the only source increasingly of locally owned, locally controlled, content. Now there's a lot of attention appropriately given to the major stations in America's large cities. We've all seen and heard programming from stations in Boston and San Francisco, New York, even Portland, Oregon. Oregon Public Broadcasting is recognized as one of these national leaders. But for much of America outside the major metropolitan areas, public broadcasting actually plays an even more important role. In the Rockies, uh, the Pacific Northwest, rural areas, the upper Midwest, often public broadcasting is not just the only local source, it's the only source of information that relates directly to their communities. And you know, the big stations in the large communities are going to be harmed by, these, by this assault on public broadcasting. Um, my own public broadcasting in Oregon will lose $2.4 million. It will really harm the quality of that effort. But it is in rural and small town America that the greatest damage will be done. For example, it costs in eastern Oregon, it costs 11 times as much to get a signal to Burns than it does in the more populous Willamette Valley. And there simply isn't the base of population to make up for it with local contributions. It's ironic that these partisans are attacking one of America's best public-private partnerships. It's not uncommon for the public investment to leverage $6 or more of private investment to make this high-quality programming 
possible. Now, there are some who claim that in an era of 5,000 cable and satellite stations, um, that we don't need another source of information. Well, those people fail to get grasp the power of non-commercial public broadcasting, how it is unique today. There are countless shows that are directed towards America's kids, but public broadcasting provides the only children's programming that is trying to educate and entertain our children, not sell them something. The public supports public broadcasting not just in opinion polls, but with millions of dollars of voluntary contributions that they make every year to provide the quality programming. And I fear that this reckless partisan assault on public broadcasting is actually going to hurt our long-term efforts to tame the budget deficit. Uh, trading a savings of less than one half cent per day per American won't offset the damage to public confidence by eliminating what so many people believe in and count upon. But more important, it will be a loss of a valuable tool to educate and inform the public from a respected nonpartisan source exactly how we're going to need to get information to the American public to deal with this massive deficit problem that we face. For those of us uh, to meet America's challenge, public broadcasting is an essential ally. But I will say that with the tremendous outpouring of support that we are now seeing people calling and writing members of Congress, stopping them on the street, I think there is a good chance that those 1,300 public broadcasting stations will still be here in the future helping inform the debates of today if all of us do our job, listen to the public, and do what is in the best long-term interests of this country. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back the remainder of his time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, California. excuse me, California, Mr. McClintock, for five minutes. Uh, Madam Speaker, last year I voted to extend the Patriot Act for one year. I regret that vote and was glad to have been able to correct it although I'm pained that the uh, House voted otherwise yesterday. Uh, during this past year, I've become convinced that the provisions of the so-called Patriot Act are an affront to the Bill of Rights and a serious threat to our fundamental liberty as Americans. The Fourth Amendment arises from the abuses of the British Crown that allowed roving searches by revenue agents under the guise of what were called writs of assistance or general warrants. Instead of following specific allegations against specific individuals, the Crown's revenue agents were given free reign to search indiscriminately. In 1761, the famous colonial leader James Otis challenged these writs, arguing that, quote, a man's house is his castle, and whilst he is quiet, he is as well guarded as a prince in his castle. This writ, if it should be declared legal, would totally annihilate this privilege. 250 years later, the Patriot Act restores those roving searches. In the audience that day in 1761 was a 25-year-old lawyer named John Adams. He would later recall, quote, Every man of an immense crowded audience appeared to me to go away as I did, ready to take arms against writs of assistance. Then and there was the first scene of the first act of opposition to the arbitrary claims of Great Britain. Then and there, the child independence was born. The American founders responded with the Fourth Amendment. It provides that before the government can invade a person's privacy, the executive branch must present sworn testimony to an independent judiciary that a crime has occurred and that there is reason to believe that an individual should be searched for evidence of the crime and then specify the place to be searched and the things to be seized. The John Doe roving wiretaps provided under this bill are a clear breach of this crystal clear provision. 
The entire point of having an open and independent judiciary is so that abuses of power can be quickly identified by the public and corrected. The very structure of this law prevents this from occurring. I also object to the lone wolf provision of the act that allows a person who's not acting in concert with the foreign power to be treated as if they were. This malignant fiction utterly blurs the critical distinction between a private person protected under our Constitution and an enemy combatant acting as an agent of a foreign power. My chief of staff, uh, Igor Berman, was born in Moscow. His family immigrated to America when he was 14. He tells of the days leading up to their long-awaited departure. His father had technical expertise, and the authorities were desperate to find some pretense to cancel the family's exit visa. A week before they departed for America, the family returned home to find that the Soviet authorities had turned their apartment upside down, looking for anything that could be used to block their immigration. This was not the result of suspected criminal activity, but rather the same kind of open-ended search the Fourth Amendment protects us against. His younger brother was terrified and hysterical. His mother calmed the little boy by saying, don't worry, don't worry. We're leaving in a few days for America. This will never happen to us there. Our country is threatened by foreign governments and by multinational terrorist groups, which are actively do, trying to do us harm, backed by a fifth column within our own borders. But we have faced far more powerful governments and far better organized networks of spies and saboteurs in the past without having to shred our Bill of Rights. The freedom that our Constitution protects is the source of our economic prosperity, our moral authority, and our martial strength. It is also the ultimate bulwark against authoritarianism. Abraham Lincoln was right. No transatlantic military giant, let alone some fanatical terrorist group, can ever step across the ocean and crush us at a blow. And no foreign power can destroy our Constitution. Only we can do that. As Lincoln said, as a nation of free men, we are destined to live forever or to die by suicide. I yield back. The gentleman yields back the remainder of his time. I, the chair recognizes the gentle lady from Ohio for five minutes. Thank you. Um, Ms. Fudge. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, Republicans have introduced a irresponsible and dangerous spending bill that cuts jobs, threatens American innovation, and diminishes investments in rebuilding America. Republicans only want to offer Americans a pink slip. We all want to find an appropriate way to reduce our deficit but this certainly is not the way. Republicans have proposed a resolution that will not decrease the deficit, but that will add $5 trillion to the deficit uh, through tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans, uh, unlimited war funding, and the repeal of the health care legislation. Uh, we have not presented, they have not presented a serious plan for actually addressing the deficit. The irresponsible impact of Republican spending in education, Democrats are going to fight with everything we have to ensure that the next generation of students is prepared to become the educated workforce of tomorrow. More than 200,000 children would be kicked out of Head Start. The Republicans believe that thousands of teachers should lose their jobs. The Republicans believe that Pell Grant recipients should lose $800 worth of financial support to pursue their educations. In the area of innovation, America's competitiveness depends on our ability to innovate and keep America number one. Republicans believe that there should be 20,000 fewer researchers supported by, by the National Science Foundation. They believe that there should be a $1.4 billion reduction in science and energy research. They believe that there should be $2.5 billion in cuts to the National Institutes of Health, representing a significant setback in cancer and other diseases and research in general, which will especially hit hard the district I represent. If we're talking about rebuilding America, Democrats support key investments in roads, schools, bridges that are critical 
for businesses to grow and that create good paying American jobs. Republicans would rescind more than two and a half billion dollars for high speed rail projects that have already been awarded. That would allow the loss of more than 25,000 new construction jobs and the cancellation of 76 projects in 40 states. Republicans would cut $234 million designed to improve our nation's air traffic control system. And as it relates to public safety, one of the most important things that a government does provide, we are here to take care of our people. We are to provide safety. The Republicans propose less, more than 1,300 fewer cops should be on the streets because they're going to eliminate the cops grants. Uh, they would have less than 2,400 firefighters on the job because they are going to eliminate funding for safer grants. As President Obama said, we must out-innovate, out-educate, out and out-build the rest of the world. Let's invest in America. Let us reject the Republican CR. Madam Speaker, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back the remainder of her time. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Maine. Ms. Pinegree for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we are facing some very important and difficult decisions in the coming weeks as we debate both the continuing resolution and the President's budget. I'd like to talk just a little bit about some of the decisions that we have to make today. Uh, as we discuss this this morning, as some of my colleagues have already mentioned, the proposed continuing resolution that the Republicans have put on the table has draconian cuts that will not move our country forward. Whether it's cuts to the National Institutes of Health and investigating uh, important research that we have before us, or cuts to our infrastructure, or education, arts and culture, cuts to our police protection and fire protection in our home communities. Uh, this budget does not do what the American people need and it will not move us forward. The proposed continuing resolution has made one particular cut that I want to discuss in more detail. For a party that discusses itself as the party of jobs and says they want to move the economy forward, I am very disturbed to see that they are slashing the funding for the Economic Development Authority and I'm here to say that doing so will pull the rug out from the very people who are creating jobs and helping turn our economy around. Last year I brought the administrator of the Economic Development Authority to Maine and he saw firsthand, as he well knew, how EDA funding could help make it possible to build a new freezer facility in the city of Portland. This is a critical infrastructure improvement for our already struggling Maine fishermen. This would make it possible so that they would not have to send their catch off to another state or even another country to be processed. If we can build that freezer in Portland, hundreds of jobs could be created and our working waterfronts could be strengthened. Also in Maine, the community of Brunswick has been hit by a BRAC, a base closure, and they have worked long and hard to de develop economic development opportunities that will strengthen that community and reuse the base. They've successfully attracted exciting new projects, including an aircraft manufacturing facility using carbon fiber, high technology materials, and the highest technology in new engineering and building on the site of the former air base. But those projects and the hundreds of jobs that they will create are counting on the EDA funding to help transform what was once a former Navy base into a civilian economic engine. The economy is just starting to turn around and eliminating the critical investments we need to keep it going is the last thing we should be doing right now. I want to say a couple of things too about the President's budget. The President has put forward a budget on the table that does many of the things that we need to have done. Investing in infrastructure, science and technology, education, the very kinds of things that will make our country competitive and move us forward. There are many good things in this budget, whether it's eliminating the tax breaks for big oil companies, no further extensions of tax cuts for the wealthy, uh, making sure we do increase the Economic Development Administration and invest in economic development, investing in health care, continuing to implement the health care reform bill, 
or putting money into the critical training of 4,000 more primary care providers. I know that's a huge need in my state and so many other states. As well as uh, working to move forward on the permanent fix to the SGR so that our physicians are adequately reimbursed. Investments in housing, making sure that the homeless veterans uh, are no longer on our streets anymore and that people have more choices to move forward in housing. Eliminating tax breaks for big oil companies, making our commercial buildings more efficient, even cutting defense in strategic ways. Up to $78 billion in wasteful spending is cut out of the President's budget. Cutting of the alternative engine for the F-35, which is just wasteful, un unnecessary, um, as at the same time he is making sure that our military personnel get a pay raise and that they are recognized and supported. I do need to discuss one issue in the President's budget that will be a problem for my constituents in Maine. The President's budget proposes to cut LIHEAP funding. I am, uh, let me just make sure I've got this. LIHEAP funding helps nearly 70,000 Maine households make ends meet by offsetting home heating costs. Funding is especially important for Maine. We have some of the country's oldest housing stock, and we are heavily dependent on oil for heating. In fact, we are the most dependent state in the nation on oil heat. The cost of heating oil is going up, from a low of about 2.25 at the beginning of the economic downturn to about $3.35 now. Maine communities are still struggling with the down economy. The lady slashing time funding has for this program will not be appropriate yet, and it must be changed in the president's budget. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Ellison, for five minutes. Madam Speaker, I uh, come before the House today to talk about a critically important program that I think all Americans need to know about and is hanging in the balance as we approach this continuing resolution. And the program I'm here to talk about is the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, also known as LIHEAP. Now, LIHEAP is a program commonly believed to be an income support program, but actually, Madam Speaker, is not an income support program. LIHEAP, which provides energy to low income families, heating oil, things like that, is actually a health program and a program that is designed to make sure that citizens do not have to choose between heat and eat. They do not have to choose between dinner and a warm room. And many of us who are from places like Minnesota, my own home state, but also add to that Michigan, Maine, New, Jer New Jersey, New Hampshire, Add to that many other, Montana, many others, and even some states that we think of as more mother states, but in the winter can get cold too. Really, people depend upon these programs to really survive. In my own state, if LIHEAP is cut, several people will simply go without. And of course, I have statistics here, Mr. Spe Madam Speaker, but rather than talk about statistics, I want to talk about a man who lives in my district who. Uh, was actually not a LIHEAP recipient, but was eligible for the program and didn't, didn't use it. And he uh, didn't have enough money for his heat. So what he did is he kind of jerry-rigged some space heaters, and he kind of made do. And this caused a fire, Madam Speaker, which resulted in his death. And when I looked up what, what really happens, how often do people die from space heaters, you know, the numbers are not always consistent, but upwards of 32% of all home fires are because of space heaters, and about 75% of all home fires uh, are due, uh, deaths are due to space heaters. Deaths. People die when this happens because they don't have the energy assistance that they need, and our Congress right now, under Republican majority, is talking about cutting this program even more. Now, you think about a winter like this one, Madam Speaker, where there has been record snowfalls in many places around our country, and it's been cold since October in Minnesota. And the fact is, is that people, are, programs that provide LIHEAP funding are already running out of money. And if, we, and if they were drawn back to 2008 spending levels, we would have, been, we would have run out of LIHEAP funding 
in January. January. In Minnesota, it really does not warm up until around April. And so this is, this is terrible. Madam Speaker, let me tell you, if you look at young people, kids, statistics show that if a family does not have to put a bunch of money into heating the home, the child's diet improves and the kid has enough to eat before he goes to school, which means that that little girl or that little boy can sit in a classroom without their stomach growling and can actually pay attention to the lessons that's going on because their family has some home energy assistance. Our seniors are poor in prescription. It's about the prescription or it's about the heated room. Madam Speaker, it's not right to tell, to tell Americans that the wealthiest and most well-to-do among us get their tax break extended and the poorest among us, well, they can just go get another blanket. That's wrong. We're failing a moral test of our nation when we do things like this. And, 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 and Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I want to I raise this issue that we consider what we are doing to our society. It's not welfare. It's not income support. It is a health program. It is a health program designed to make sure that Americans don't freeze to death in their own homes. It is a health program designed to make sure that Americans don't have to make awful decisions about medication, about food, and things like this. It is, a, it is a health program, and it's a program that has done countless amount of good for many, many people, that helps seniors, that helps children. And I'm very proud, Madam Speaker, as I close, to quote a man from my state of Minnesota. His name was Hubert H. Humphrey. And he said, the moral test of a nation is how it treats people in the dawn of life, our children, people in the twilight of life, our seniors, and people in the shadows of life the poor and underprivileged. If we cut low-income energy the gentleman's assistance, time has expired. we fail that moral test. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it has been six weeks now since Republicans assumed control of the House of Representatives and we have yet to see a single job creation bill brought to the House floor. Indeed, just last week, we spent roughly 10 hours debating a primary function of Congress, that of congressional oversight, something we already do. Yet still, no legislation brought forward to spur job creation. But while the Republican Congress has yet to bring forward a jobs agenda, they have found plenty of time to bring forward an extreme anti-woman agenda. Just recently, we saw the introduction of H.R. 3, legislation that originally sought to redefine the, re the definition of rape. Yep, that's right, legislation that would change rape from acting without a woman's consent to instead require women to pr prove force was used in order to prove rape. It remains to be seen whether Republicans working on this legislation have shelved their plans to redefine rape and whether they will revise the language in H.R. 3. Still, 163 Republicans signed on as co-sponsors of the bill with the forcible rape language included. But the extreme anti-woman agenda doesn't stop with attempting to, define, to redefine rape. This week, the House will vote on an amendment introduced by Representative Mike Pence that would eliminate family planning and life-saving preventive care to millions of individuals each year. Mr. Pence's amendment does this by eliminating Title X funding. Since 1970, the Title, the Title X family planning program has been a key component of our nation's health care infrastructure and an essential element in the winning strategy to reduce unintended pregnancies. Efforts to cut the Title X program would take away funding from essential women's health care providers like Planned Parenthood. Today, Title X serves over 5 million low-income individuals every year. In every state, women and men rely on Title X for basic primary and preventive health care, including annual exams, life-saving cancer screenings, contraception and testing and treatment for sexually transmitted diseases. In fact, in 2009 alone, Title X providers performed 2.2 million pap tests, 2.3 million breast exams, and over 6 million tests for sexually transmitted diseases, including nearly 1 million HIV tests. And preventative care isn't limited to cancer screenings and education on how to avoid STDs. Title X actually reduces the number of abortions. In fact, 
Title X services help to prevent nearly one million unintended pregnancies each year, almost half of which would otherwise end in abortion. Planned Parenthood and the Title X program provide vital family planning services which help improve the life of the mother and the child. Indeed, family planning keeps women and children healthy. Studies have shown that when women have better access to family planning, it leads to healthier outcomes for both mother and child. When women plan their pregnancies, they are more likely to seek prenatal care, improving their own health and the health of their children. In fact, access to family planning is directly linked to declines in maternal and infant mortality rates. Eliminating the National Family Planning Program will result in millions of women across the country losing access to basic primary and preventative health care and to the providers that offer these services. Without Title X, more women will experience unintended pregnancies and face potentially life-threatening cancer and other diseases that could have been prevented. The simple fact is that this proposal is anti-woman and anti-family. Now I know that we're all interested in finding ways to cut federal spending, and Representative Pence's amendment to eliminate funding for Title X is framed in the context of fiscal responsibility. But even more important than cutting spending is asking the question, are we reducing the deficit? Unfortunately, the answer to whether the Pence Amendment would also cut the deficit is no. That's because Title X actually saves taxpayer dollars. Since many of the patients served by Title X are on Medicaid, preventative care, like cancer screenings and contraceptive counseling, actually means fewer costs to the taxpayer in the long run. Indeed, for every public dollar invested in family planning, $3.74 is saved in Medicaid-related costs. That's savings to both federal and state governments. Every year, Planned Parenthood works tirelessly to help to improve the health of communities across this country. Efforts to undermine the Title X program and this essential health care provider are not only reckless, they are also anti-woman, anti-child, and anti-taxpayer. Can we please stop the relentless attack on women, stop pursuing the divisive anti-woman legislation, and focus on job creation and spurring economic growth once and for all? Thank you, Mr. Madam Speaker. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentle lady yields back the remainder of her time. Pursuant to Clause 12A of Rule 1, the Chair declares the House in recess until noon today. And the House returns in just over an hour at noon Eastern to begin work on federal spending for the remainder of this year.